I re-uploaded a video today because of what's happening about uh, the possibility of a, uh, of a coup being likely in China. Yeah, I said that the China is a nation that uh, that is especially going to be prone to uh, undergoing coups. And lots of people g- get upset about that. There, So two people here, Shri Sayas, Shreyas and Icon6754. Uh, don't you think the same thing applies to India as well? Why don't you talk about that? And doesn't the per capita GDP argument apply to India as well? India's per capita income is unfortunately less than that, less than half of China. Yes, certain things apply to India, but does the overall thing to apply to India? See, when when you say good things about India and you say bad things about China, it somehow makes very some people very upset. I don't know why. Anyhow, let me explain why this does not apply to India. There are three preconditions to a coup. How do I know this? You see this book up here, this pink book here. Can you see that? That is a book called Coup d'Etat. Its author is Dr. Edward Lutwak, who has been on this podcast. I think Dr. Lutwak wrote this book as a very young man, I think in the 1960s. This book, this this one that I have over here, it's a 21st century version of that uh, older book. It's still as relevant today as it was all those years ago, right? So there are three preconditions to a coup happening successfully in a nation. And it will happen successfully only if all three preconditions are satisfied. So what are the three preconditions for a coup? Let's take nations like India, China, Pakistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and let's take the US as well. So let's keep these countries in mind. And now now, now let's talk about the preconditions of a coup. The first precondition out of three, is economic backwardness. So when you have economic backwardness in a country, you're going to have other factors that that are emerge out of it. You will have disease, you will have illiteracy, you will have a high birth rate and a high death rate. You will have periodic episodes of hunger, famines or whatever it is, droughts, no, periodic hunger. You're going to have a huge disparity of income. The majority of the people in a nation will have very low income and they will be marginalized by a very small number of people who hold all the power and who hold all the money. So there's going to be a huge income disparity. 98% of people will will be subsisting on, let's say, 100 uh, rupees a day or or $2 a day or whatever it is, $1 a day. And the elite, the very small elite, will be living uh, li- lives like millionaires and they will li- be living lives of luxury. Do you have that in India? I think India is getting more prosperous. The people, the per capita GDP, GDP is rising. And the cost of living is low in India. It's not only about the per capita GDP. It's all about the also about the cost of living. So in some nations, the incomes are low and the cost of living is very high. And that is what creates incredible distress in society. In India, the average income is rising year after year. The per capita GDP is rising. And the cost of living throughout most of India is still very, very low. So India is, indeed, India has some economic backwardness, but that is being worked on. The the nation is rising and there is no marginalization of the the majority by a very small minority. Like you have in, in any communist society, where the Politburo, Very small number of people who run the Communist Party, who hold all the power, they also hold all the money and everything else is collectivized and privatized and and that sort of thing. China is not following socialism or communism anymore. It is uh, a a capitalist society, an imperial society, but you do have the marginalization of the minority, of the majority by a very small minority. So the outcome of economic backwardness is that the social and economic conditions of the nation are such that they confine economic and political participation to a small fraction of the population. Does that is that precondition satisfied in India? In India, people are aspirational. People's incomes are increasing. People are able to consume more, buy more things. Everybody can participate politically. Everybody votes and everybody can actually stand for election if they want to. They have to figure out the right way of doing it, but it's possible. It's open to all. So in India, economic and political participation is not confined to a small fraction of the population. It is not. In China, it's the, the it's the various Chinese billionaires who 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 rise to the top because they satisfy certain conditions laid out by the Chinese Communist Party, and so the economic participation is confined to a small fraction. Even the political participation, the true political participation, is confined to a small fraction of the population. So, 
So uh, the first precondition of economic backwardness and economic and political marginalization is satisfied in China, but not in India. It's also satisfied in Pakistan. It could also, um, yeah, it's not satisfied in the US. In the US, everybody can vote and everybody can can uh, benefit from capitalism. So once again, the US doesn't satisfy it. India doesn't uh, satisfy it. Bangladesh increasingly doesn't satisfy this precondition, but China satisfies it and Pakistan certainly satisfies it. That's why China and Pakistan are prone to coups. What is the second precondition of a coup succeeding? The second precondition is political independence. The, the nation needs to be politically independent. And Dr. Lutwak in this book, he speaks about the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. So in the 1956 Hungarian Revolution, the people who participated in this revolution to free Hungary from USSR, they were able to take over the armed forces of the country. They were able to take over the police of the country. They were able to secure all the radio stations and all the communications facilities. They did all that. And yet, the revolution failed. Why did it fail? Because the true power in the country was not in the Hungarian armed forces, not the police, not the radio stations, not the communications facilities. The true power was the presence of the Soviet Red Army inside Hungary and around Hungary. This was a greater source of power to any government that was supported by Moscow than any element within the country. Right. So the control of the Red Army was in Moscow. Therefore, the Therefore, the Hungarian revolution would have succeeded only if it had been carried out from Moscow, not from Budapest in Hungary. You see, so that is the deal about political independence. The nation must be substantially politically independent and the influence of external powers, foreign powers in its internal political life must be relatively limited. You can never have complete political independence and complete non-interference from outside inside inside your country. But the interference and influence of foreign powers must be substantially limited and less. That is called political independence. So is India politically independent? More or less India is politically independent. right? So therefore a coup cannot really happen in India. Is Pakistan politically independent? Where there is substantial interference inside Pakistan, uh, from external, external factors. The Pakistan army has always been propped up by external actors. First it was the British, then it was the Americans, and now it is the Chinese. So Pakistan does satisfy the preconditions of, of the coup. When it comes to China, you don't have substantial political uh, interference within China. And yet the structure of the Chinese Communist Party is that you will have political interference from within the Chinese Communist Party, and you will have always you will always have these various centers of power that will seek to come up quietly and grab the the power at the right time, especially the so-called People's Liberation Army that actually can act as a major uh, factor in in Chinese politics. In India, the army is 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 non-political. In China, the army is very political. In Pakistan, also the army is very political. In the U.S. The army is not political. It it obeys whatever the state tells it to do. Whatever the president and whoever else runs the thing, it obeys them. In India, the army always obeys the uh, center, the, the central government. In China, the army is a major factor. It has its own politics. In, in Pakistan also. So that's why, once again, China satisfies the, pre the precondition. Pakistan satisfies the second precondition. India does not. The US does not. Uh, Bangladesh also most likely nowadays does not. Let's see. Right? And the third precondition, the last final precondition of a coup is what Dr. Lutwak say, calls organic unity, which means that the nation must have a, a political center. If there are multiple political centers, these must be uh, organized and structured politically, not ethnically. Right? If you have a mono... Uh, if you have something that is monolithic, if you have a monolithic nation with only one ethnicity and only one religion or whatever you want, or only one ideology, then all even if you have multiple centers of political power, these are structured politically, not ethnically or religiously. Right? So in Pakistan, there is only one political center, which is the Pakistani army. There are no other 
genuine centers of political power none whatsoever you have elections you have state governments but these are all sham the real power is just the P- pakistani army there is no other real power any prime minister who is currently in power is just a puppet they do what they are told similarly in china there is only one political center the chinese communist party and whoever runs the chinese communist party is the boss there are other political centers in various uh, provinces of china but these are subsidiary these are also chinese political uh, chinese communist party centers and these are all subsidiary to the uh, politburo so it has a very clear center of political power that's why china and pakistan once again satisfy the preconditions of a coup in india we have a central government that is to many to to a large extent in some ways powerless when it comes to influencing in the various state governments india we call it the power of federalism i think it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's not the it's not a good thing actually to have too much federalism yeah because that is because the state the central government sometimes is powerless to stop the states from doing certain things you have a project i am not naming any state by the way please understand this i'm not naming any specific state let's say you have a project of of uh, uh, constructing a railway corridor from which includes seven states then you have to go through a whole process of buying the land acquiring the land and constructing everything and so on and so forth if certain states refuse to cooperate then you will not be able to build the rail corridor through those three or four states and then the entire project is ruined right that's one example if you have certain border states that kind of have an open border policy and they allow infiltrators to come in well that's again a huge issue and this is, sometimes the central government may not be in a position to stop that from happening because the, unless they want to overthrow the government uh, put president's rule in which case the supreme court will intervene and, and prevent this from happening so there are so many problems in india there are so many different centers of power these are all based on languages every state is is based on language language based states you have maharashtra where you have marathi you have odisha where you have uh, odia you have tamil nadu which is a tamil region you have karnataka with kannada speaking people you you have punjab with punjabi speaking people and so on and so forth so on and so forth everything is linguistically based and when you have linguist uh, linguistic divisions you people will also perceive that to be ethnic divisions even though we all indians are the same people so india is a chaotic country it doesn't have a political center a coup can never ever succeed in india for this precise reason it's impossible for a coup to succeed in india the us is not ethnically structured the us actually does satisfy this particular precondition of a coup right india does not pakistan does single single religion everything else is immaterial so once again pakistan has a political center it is not structured ethnically it is structured politically it's just one religion everything else is is unacceptable similarly bangladesh also satisfies this precondition and china is just i mean the chinese do have various uh, ethnicities like the tibetans whom they have forcibly amal- uh, amalgamated they have the uyghurs they have various other ethnicities like the like the thai people in the yunnan province and the the manchu people in in manchuria which is again illegally mm-hmm. next by china and so on and so forth but there is only one dominant ethnicity which is the han chinese and only one language is allowed which is the uh, the um, mandarin chinese language right and so on so paki so china is like a monolithic nation other ethnicities exist other nations uh, other languages exist but those are completely marginalized only one dominant ethnicity exists which is the han chinese only one language is allowed and only one ideology is allowed which is the ideology of the chinese communist party whatever is in uh, vogue right now so china has a very clear political center and it is completely politically structured all it is just one ethnicity which makes it a monolithic, monolithic monolithic country and therefore china satisfies all three preconditions for a coup so does pakistan india doesn't satisfy any of the preconditions of a coup the us satisfies maybe one or two preconditions but not all and so on so i hope this detailed exposition of the matter sets this uh, question to rest that why china is way more predisposed to a coup than most of the nations and india simply cannot have a coup that can succeed i hope that answers the question